This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Myths That Every Child Should Know A Selection of the Classical Myths of All Times for Young People Edited by Hamilton Wright Mabai Chapter 15 The Death of Balder there was one shadow which always fell over Asgard. Sometimes in the long years the gods almost forgot it. It lay so far off, like a dim cloud in a clear sky. But Odin saw it deepen and widen as he looked out into the universe, and he knew that the last great battle would surely come, when the gods themselves would be destroyed and a long twilight would rest on all the worlds. And now the day was close at hand. Misfortunes never came singly to men, and they did not to the gods. Idun, the beautiful goddess of youth, whose apples were the joy of all Asgard, made a resting place for herself among the massive branches of Yggdrasil, and there every evening came Bragi, and he sang so sweetly that the birds stopped to listen, and even the Norns, those implacable sisters at the foot of the tree, were softened by the melody. But poetry cannot change the purposes of fate. And one evening no song was heard of Bragi or the birds. The leaves of the world tree hung withered and lifeless on the branches, and the fountain from which they had daily been sprinkled was dry at last. Idun had fallen into the dark valley of death, and when Bragi, Heimdall, and Loki went to question her about the future, she could answer them only with tears. Bragi would not leave his wife alone amid the dim shades that crowded the dreary valley, and so youth and genius vanished out of Asgard forever. Baldr was the most godlike of all the gods, because he was the purest and the best. Wherever he went his coming was like the coming of sunshine, and all the beauty of summer was but the shining of his face. When men's hearts were white like the light, and their lives clear as the day, it was because Baldr was looking down upon them with those soft clear eyes that were open windows to the soul of God. He had always lived in such a glow of brightness that no darkness had ever touched him. But one morning, after Idun and Bragi had gone, Baldr's face was sad and troubled. He walked slowly from room to room in his palace, Breidablik, stainless as the sky when April showers have swept across it because no impure thing had ever crossed the threshold. And his eyes were heavy with sorrow. In the night, terrible dreams had broken his sleep and made it a long torture. The air seemed to be full of awful changes for him and for all the gods. He knew in his soul that the shadow of the last great day was sweeping on. As he looked out and saw the worlds lying in light and beauty, the fields yellow with waving grain, the deep fjords flashing back the sunbeams from their clear depths, the verdure clothing the loftiest mountains, and knew that over all this darkness and desolation would come. With silence of reapers and birds, with fading of leaf and flower, a great sorrow fell on his heart. Baldur could bear the burden no longer. He went out, called all the gods together, and told them the terrible dreams of the night. Every face was heavy with care. The death of Baldur would be like the going out of the sun, and after a long, sad counsel, the gods resolved to protect him from harm by pledging all things to stand between him and any hurt. So Frigg, his mother, went forth and made everything promise on a solemn oath not to injure her son. Fire, iron, all kinds of metal, every sort of stone, trees, earth, diseases, birds, beasts, snakes, as the anxious mother went to them, solemnly pledged themselves that no harm should come near Balder. Everything promised, and Frigg thought she had driven away the cloud, but fate was stronger than her love, and one little shrub had not sworn. Odin was not satisfied even with these precautions, for whichever way he looked, the shadow of a great sorrow spread over the worlds. He began to feel as if he were no longer the greatest of the gods, and he could almost hear the rough shouts of the frost giants crowding the rainbow bridge on their way into Asgard. When trouble comes to men it is hard to bear, but to a god who had so many worlds to guide and rule it was a new and terrible thing. 
Odin thought and thought until he was weary, but no gleam of light could he find anywhere. It was thick darkness everywhere. At last he could bear the suspense no longer, and saddling his horse he rode sadly out of Asgard to Niflheim, the home of Hel, whose face was as the face of death itself. As he drew near the gates, a monstrous dog came out and barked furiously. But Odin rode a little eastward of the shadowy gates to the grave of wonderful prophetess. It was a cold, gloomy place, and the soul of the great god was pierced with a feeling of hopeless sorrow as he dismounted from Slepnir. And bending over the grave began to chant weird songs and weave magical charms over it. When he had spoken those wonderful words which could waken the dead from their sleep, there was an awful silence for a moment, and then a faint ghost-like voice came from the grave. Who art thou, it said, who breaketh the silence of death, and calleth the sleeper out of her long slumbers? Ages ago I was laid at rest here. Snow and rain have fallen upon me through myriad years. Why dost thou disturb me? I am Vegtam, answered Odin and I come to ask why the couches of hell are hung with gold and the benches strewn with shining rings. It is done for Balder, answered the awful voice. Ask me no more. Odin's heart sank when he heard these words, but he was determined to know the worst. I will ask thee until I know all. Who shall strike the fatal blow? If I must, I must, moaned the prophetess. Hoder shall smite his brother Balder and send him down to the dark home of hell. The mead is already brewed for Balder, and the despair draweth near. Then Odin, looking into the future across the open grave, saw all the days to come. Who is this, he said, seeing that which no mortal could have seen? Who is this that shall not weep for Balder? Then the prophetess knew that it was none other than the greatest of the gods who had called her up. Thou art not Vegtam, she exclaimed. Thou art Odin himself, the king of men. And thou, answered Odin angrily, art no prophetess, but the mother of three giants. Ride home then, and exult in what thou hast discovered, said the dead woman. Never shall my slumbers be broken again, until Loki shall burst his chains, and the great battle come. And Odin rode sadly homeward, knowing that already Niflheim was making itself beautiful against the coming of Balder. The other gods, meanwhile, had become merry again, for had not everything promised to protect their beloved Balder? They even made sport of that which troubled them, for when they found that nothing could hurt Balder, and that all things glanced aside from his shining form, they persuaded him to stand as a target for their weapons, hurling darts, spears, swords, and battle-axes at him, all of which went singing through the air and fell harmless at his feet. But Loki, when he saw these sports, was jealous of Balder, and went about thinking how he could destroy him. It happened that as Frigg sat spinning in her house Finsal, the soft wind blowing in at the windows and bringing the merry shouts of the gods at play, an old woman entered and approached her. Do you know, asked the newcomer, what they are doing in Asgard? They are throwing all manner of dangerous weapons at Balder. He stands there like the sun for brightness and against his glory spears and battle-axes fall powerless to the ground. Nothing can harm him. No, answered Frigg joyfully. Nothing can bring him any hurt, for I have made everything in heaven and earth swear to protect him. What? said the old woman. Has everything sworn to guard Balder? Yes, said Frigg. Everything has sworn except one little shrub, which is called mistletoe, and grows on the eastern side of Valhal. I did not take an oath from that because I thought it too young and weak. When the old woman heard this, a strange light came into her eyes. She walked off much faster than she had come in, and no sooner had she passed beyond Frigg's sight than this same feeble old woman grew suddenly erect, shook off her woman's garments, and there stood Loki himself. In a moment he had reached the slope east of Valhal, had plucked a twig of the unsworn mistletoe, and was back in the circle of the gods, who were still at their favorite pastime with Balder. Hodor was standing silent and alone outside the noisy throng, for he was blind. Loki touched him. Why do you not throw something at Balder? Because I cannot see where Balder stands, and have nothing to throw if I could, replied Hodor. If that is all, said Loki, come with me. 
I will give you something to throw and direct your aim. Hoder, thinking no evil, went with Loki and did as he was told. A little sprig of mistletoe shot through the air, pierced the heart of Balder, and in a moment the beautiful god lay dead upon the field. A shadow rose out of the deep beyond the worlds and spread itself over heaven and earth, for the light of the universe had gone out. The gods could not speak for horror. They stood like statues for a moment, and then a hopeless wail burst from their lips. Tears fell like rain from eyes that had never wept before, for Balder, the joy of Asgard, had gone to Niflheim and left them desolate. But Odin was saddest of all, because he knew the future, and he knew that peace and light had fled from Asgard forever, and that the last day and the long night were hurrying on. Frigg could not give up her beautiful son, and when her grief had spent itself a little, she asked who would go to hell and offer her a rich ransom if she would permit Balder to return to Asgard. I will go, said her maud. Swift at the word of Odin, Sleipnir was led forth, and in an instant Hermod was galloping furiously away. Then the gods began with sorrowful hearts to make ready for Baldur's funeral. When the once beautiful form had been arrayed in grave clothes, they carried it reverently down to the deep sea, which lay calm as a summer afternoon, waiting for its precious burden. Close to the water's edge lay Baldur's ringhorn, the greatest of all the ships that sailed the seas. But when the gods tried to launch it, they could not move it an inch. The great vessel creaked and groaned, but no one could push it down to the water. Odin walked about it with a sad face, and the gentle ripple of the little waves chasing each other over the rocks seemed a mocking laugh to him. Send to Jotunheim for Hyrokin, he said at last, and a messenger was soon flying for that mighty giantess. In a little time, Hyrokin came riding swiftly on a wolf so large and fierce that he made the gods think of Fenrir. When the giantess had alighted, Odin ordered four berserkers of mighty strength to hold the wolf, but he struggled so angrily that they had to throw him on the ground before they could control him. Then Hyrokin went to the prow of the ship and with one mighty effort sent it far into the sea the rollers underneath bursting into flame, and the whole earth trembling with the shock. Thor was so angry at the uproar that he would have killed the giantess on the spot if he had not been held back by the other gods. The great ship floated on the sea as she had often done before, when Balder, full of life and beauty, set all her sails and was borne joyfully across the tossing seas. Slowly and solemnly, the dead god was carried on board, and as Nana, his faithful wife, saw her husband born for the last time from the earth, which he had made so dear to her and beautiful to all men, her heart broke with sorrow, and they laid her beside Balder on the funeral pyre. Since the world began, no one had seen such a funeral. No bells tolled, no long procession of mourners moved across the hills, but all the worlds lay under a deep shadow, and from every quarter came those who had loved or feared Balder. There at the very water's edge stood Odin himself, the ravens flying about his head, and on his majestic face a gloom that no sun would ever lighten again. And there was Frigg, the desolate mother, whose son had already gone so far that he would never come back to her. There was Fry, standing sad and stern in his chariot. And there was Freya, the goddess of love, from whose eyes fell a shining rain of tears. There too was Heimdall, on his horse Goldtop, and around all these glorious ones from Asgard crowded the children of Jotunheim. Grim mountain giants seamed with scars from Thor's hammer, and frost giants who saw in the death of Balder the coming of that long winter in which they should reign through all the worlds. A deep hush fell on all created things, and every eye was fixed on the great ship riding near the shore and on the funeral pyre, rising from the deck crowned with the forms of Balder and Nana. Suddenly a gleam of light flashed over the water. The pile had been kindled, and the flames, creeping slowly at first, climbed faster and faster until they met over the dead and rose skyward. A lurid light filled the heavens and shone on the sea, and in the brightness of it the gods looked pale and sad, and the circle of giants grew darker and more portentous. Thor struck the fast-burning pyre with his consecrating hammer, 
and Odin cast into it the wonderful ring Dropner. Higher and higher leaped the flames. More and more desolate grew the scene. At last they began to sink. The funeral pyre was consumed. Balder had vanished forever. The summer was ended, and winter waited at the doors. Meanwhile, Hermod was riding hard and fast on his gloomy errand. Nine days and nights he rode through the valley so deep and dark that he could not see his horse. Stillness and blackness and solitude were his only companions until he came to the golden bridge which crosses the river Jaw. The good horse Slepner, who had carried Odin on so many strange journeys, had never traveled such a road before, and his hoofs rang drearily as he stopped short at the bridge, for in front of him stood its porter, the gigantic Modgud. Who are you? she asked, fixing her piercing eyes on her Mod. What is your name and parentage? Yesterday five bands of dead men rode across the bridge, and beneath them all it did not shake as under your single tread. There is no color of death in your face. Why ride you hither, the living among the dead? I come, said Hermod, to seek for Balder. Have you seen him pass this way? He has already crossed the bridge and taken his journey northward to hell. Then Hermod rode slowly across the bridge that spans the abyss between life and death, and found his way at last to the barred gates of hell's dreadful home. There he sprang to the ground, tightening the girths, remounted, drove the spurs deep into the horse, and Slepner, with a mighty leap, cleared the wall. Hermod rode straight to the gloomy palace, dismounted, entered, and in a moment was face to face with the terrible queen of the kingdom of the dead. Beside her, on a beautiful throne, sat Balder, pale and wan, crowned with a withered wreath of flowers, and close at hand was Nana, pallid as her husband, for whom she had died. And all night long, while ghostly forms wandered restless and sleepless through Helheim, Hermod talked with Balder and Nana. There is no record of what they said, but the talk was sad enough, doubtless, and ran like a still stream among the happy days in Asgard, when Balder's smile was mourning over the earth and the side of his face the summer of the world. When the morning came, faint and dim, through the dusky palace, Hermod sought Hel, who received him as cold and stern as fate. Your kingdom is full, O Hel, he said, and without Balder, Asgard is empty. Send him back to us once more, for there is sadness in every heart, and tears are in every eye. Through heaven and earth all things weep for him. If that is true, was the slow icy answer, if every created thing weeps for Balder, he shall return to Asgard. But if one eye is dry, he remains henceforth in Helheim. Then Hermod rode swiftly away, and the decree of Hel was soon told in Asgard. Through all the worlds, the gods sent messengers to say that all who loved Balder should weep for his return. And everywhere tears fell like rain. There was weeping in Asgard, and in all the earth there was nothing that did not weep. Men and women and little children, missing the light that had once fallen into their hearts and homes, sobbed with bitter grief. The birds of the air, who had sung carols of joy at the gates of the morning since time began, were full of sorrow. The beasts of the fields crouched and moaned in their desolation. The great trees that had put on their robes of green at Balder's command sighed as the wind wailed through them. And the sweet flowers that waited for Balder's footsteps and sprang up in all the fields to greet him hung their frail blossoms and wept bitterly for the love and the warmth and the light that had gone out. Throughout the whole earth there is nothing but weeping, and the sound of it was like the wailing of those storms in autumn that weep for the dead summer as its withered leaves drop one by one from the trees. The messengers of the gods went gladly back to Asgard, for everything had wept for Balder, but as they journeyed they came upon a giantess called Thok, and her eyes were dry. Weep for Balder, they said. With dry eyes only will I weep for Balder, she answered. Dead or alive, he never gave me gladness. Let him stay in Helheim. When she had spoken these words, a terrible laugh broke from her lips, 
and the messengers looked at each other with pallid faces, for they knew it was the voice of Loki. Baldur never came back to Asgard, and the shadows deepened over all things, for the night of death was fast coming on. The End Myths that every child should know A selection of the classic myths of all times for young people Edited by Hamilton Wright Mabai